Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss, and welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show. My guest today is Mary Carr, at Mary Carr Lit on Twitter. She's the author of three award-winning best-selling memoirs, The Liars Club, Cherry, and Lit. She's also the author of The Art of Memoir, one of my absolute favorites, which lays bare her own process as she breaks down the craft of memoir, and Tropic of Squalor, her latest volume of poetry. A Guggenheim Fellow in Poetry, Carr has won Pushcart Prizes for both verse and essays. Other grants include the Whiting Award, Penn Martha Albrand Award, and a Radcliffe Bunting Institute Fellowship. Carr is also a Peck Professor of Literature at Syracuse University. You can find her online at marycarr.com, on Twitter at marycarrlit. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. The holiday season is fast approaching, and we know that people will be buying more stuff online than ever before. All of these trends to e-commerce have been accelerated due to COVID and much more. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of a record-breaking online shopping season? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation ShipStation.com is the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. In just a few clicks, you're managing orders, printing out discounted shipping labels, and getting your products out fast. Happier holidays for you and your customers. ShipStation takes the hassle out of holiday shipping. No matter where you're selling, on Amazon, Etsy, your website via Shopify or other platforms, ShipStation brings all of your orders into one simple interface. And ShipStation works with all of the major carriers, USPS, FedEx, UPS, even international. You can compare and choose the best shipping solution every time, and you can access the same postage discounts that are usually reserved for large Fortune 500 companies. It's no wonder that ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. And right now, my listeners, that's you guys, can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code TIM. Just go to the homepage, ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in TIM, T-I-M. That's it. Go to ShipStation.com, then enter offer code TIM. ShipStation.com. Make ship happen. This podcast episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Sleep is super important to me. In the last few years, I've come to conclude it is the end-all, be-all, that all good things, good mood, good performance, good everything seem to stem from good sleep. So I've tried a lot to optimize it. I've tried pills and potions, all sorts of different mattresses, you name it. And for the last few years, I've been sleeping on a Helix Midnight Lux mattress. I also have one in the guest bedroom, and feedback from friends has always been fantastic. It's something that they comment on. Helix Sleep has a quiz, takes about two minutes to complete, that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. With Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and every body. That is your body, also your taste. So let's say you sleep on your side in like a super soft bed. No problem. Or if you're a back sleeper who likes a mattress that's as firm as a rock, they've got a mattress for you too. Helix was selected as the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ Magazine, Wired, Apartment Therapy, and many others. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Tim, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up from you if you don't love it. And now, my dear listeners, Helix is offering up to $200 off of all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash Tim. These are not cheap pillows either, so getting two for free is an upgraded deal. So that's up to $200 off and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash Tim. That's helix H E L I X sleep.com slash Tim for up to two hundred dollars off. So check it out one more time. Helix H E L I X sleep.com slash Tim. Optimal minimal. At this altitude I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now what is the inappropriate time? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. Mary, welcome to the show. Hey, Tim. Thanks for having me. And I appreciate you putting me at ease when I mentioned that I have copious notes in front of me. And that's usually an indication that I am nervous. And <laughs> you, Not you. You, you do this all the time. You're going to kill it. You're, it's going to go great. I'm convinced. And 
thank you. And you reassured me by saying, I make really good waffles. That's what I'm I do. I'm like a Nona. I'm and- like a Nona. you got to think of me as a Nona <laughs> out here in Podcastville. Well, Let's rewind the clock as a first step in Podcastville, and maybe we can talk about Nona's in the family lineage of sorts. And I want to talk about, or have you speak to, a guy redoing your mother's kitchen and holding up a tile. Could uh, you perhaps elaborate <laughs> on that, please? So, yeah, yeah. Right after my first memoir was published, we were having my mother's kitchen retiled. My sister and I were there, and that yeah, and the tile dude pries off a tile, and he holds it up, and it has a little round hole in it, and he, and he looks at my little fluffy-haired, gray-haired mother and says, Miss Card, this looks like a bullet hole. And my sister says, Mom, isn't that where you shot at Daddy? And she says, No, that's where I shot at Larry. Over there is where I shot at your Daddy. So people ask me why I wanted to be a memoirist. I'm like, why would you make stuff up? <laughs> And that's who your mother is. <laughs> so for those who have no context, I'd like to provide a bit more context. To where was this kitchen or where is this kitchen for that This matter? kitchen is in Southeast Texas. It's a town that I write about to protect the mayor and the school principal and the people who didn't sign off on what I said about them. I call it Leechfield, but it's really, it's uh, east of Port Arthur, Texas, a small town and East Texas. I call it the ringworm belt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which which I've also heard you describe as a swampy town. So moisture, humidity, ringworm. As a former wrestler, I can say those things combine to produce yes, ringworm. Exactly. <laughs> yes, no, that's it. And industrial, like a lot of oil refineries all around. So not Vienna, you know, not Paris in the twenties, I guess is the way I would put it. No. I'm going to hop around like Memento the movie, if I must. And I must because that is my way. And you've written extensively about your childhood. You had, in many respects, an extremely difficult, painful childhood and, and will probably unwind some of that. Now, you've written extensively about it, and you've also mentioned about writing memoirs. And if this is a misquote, please call me out. Quote, I've said it's hard. Here's how hard. Everybody I know who wades deep enough into memory's waters drowns a little. And certainly in your book, you paint a high resolution picture of just how painful that can be. And certainly an element might be catharsis, but it is painful. And I would love for you to speak to the catalyst for beginning to publish this type of work, write and then publish this type of work. The publishing is nothing compared to the writing, I think. Publishing for me was great because they gave me money and I didn't have any. So that was that was good. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think I had a flamethrower on my ass. Can I say ass on your show? You can say ass. Not only are our three-letter words allowed, four-letter are allowed as well. Oh, there we go. You know, I was a weird little kid and I was just... My mother was capital and nervous and married seven times and twice to my daddy. And, and uh, both my parents drank hard. It was Texas. Everybody was armed. And we were a loud, combative house. So I loved my parents. I mean, that's what I should say. It's, I don't think anybody who's read anything I've written about them would challenge that. But it was not a safe childhood. And yes, it had its fair share of of blows. I mean, I, I always, you know, look, I was born in the richest country in the world. I'm, my skin color is something the whole country privileges. I'm, you know, I'm a college professor. I've, you know, I grew up skinny and my teeth came in relatively straight and I have a lot of advantages. So whatever I went through, a lot of people and people I grew up with and loved had it way worse and didn't make it. So I think I was haunted. I was a haunted little girl. I tried to kill myself when I was a kid, when I was still in grade school. I took a bunch of aspirin. It said pain relief. And I thought, okay, this is what I want. And so I didn't have a choice. I was, in some ways, not having a choice was a lucky thing because I went into therapy very early. I managed to get, after leaving school without a diploma, I managed to weasel my way into college and had a really kind professor and his wife kind of took me under their wing and urged me to go into therapy when I was 19. And so I was sitting in rooms talking to, you know, codependent social workers starting when I was a kid. And 
all of that help, but I guess I've been really blessed with a lot of outside help. I'm a big, big fan of the mental health professional and the librarians and English teachers and uh, those kind souls you meet along the way. So you have kind souls that you meet in person. You mentioned a few, and I want to talk more about weaseling into college in a few minutes, but I've read a lot about your reading, if that makes sense. Yeah, I read a lot. Yeah. Some might envision in their mind's eye the childhood you described as a family of illiterates. Nobody picked up anything other than People magazine, but that was not the case. No, the huge advantage. Yeah. Describe that a little bit. And also, if I could tag on a, an additional piece of that question, I've heard you describe finding and reading poetry as Eucharistic. And uh, I would love for you to just speak to that as well. Yeah. I started reading poetry when I was a little girl. And I, you know, reading is socially sanctioned disassociation. You're, if you, <laughs> you know, yeah, if totally. you can't, they won't let you drink or, you know, geese heroin when you're a little kid, but, but you can disappear down a, a valley of Winnie the Pooh or Charlotte's Web or, and in some ways, the poets I read, I think a lot of time, I think poetry really captured me early. And my my mother, had, uh, who was a painter, had gone to art school in New York and was enormously well-read. There were books all over my house in a place for the nearest bookstore. The bookstores in my town sold, you know, Bibles as big as station wagons and, and uh, <laughs> you know, little, little dashboard icons. But the, there weren't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of literature to buy. But uh, I found a home in the the little library was a three block walk from my house, and I could disappear down the snowy valley of a book, and I was somewhere else. And so poetry saved my life. I mean, my best friends were poets. I, I think the way people worship saints and you know have crosses blessed, I felt that way. I and if you think about the idea of the Eucharist, we weren't Catholic, we were atheists. My father was a union organizer and said, you know, church is a trick on poor people to to get their money away from them. And my mother was a kind of Marxist lady who was very smart and, you know, just a loose, a little bit of a loose cannon. So we were not churchy in the Bible Belt. And um, yeah, you take some, when you read a poem, you know, you, you put it in the meat of your body. I mean, you're a body person. I'm a body person. I feel like you take somebody else's suffering into you and it changes you. It, it transforms you. I had this idea of being a poet starting when I was five or six years old that I wanted to be a poet. It was the strangest thing because there were no poets around. No one had ever, no one I knew had ever met a poet. What was the feeling that elicited that desire? Was it just the sort of tangible brilliance in some type of wordplay? Was it a sort of kinesthetic reaction to the aesthetics of certain poets? What was it that, wow. that produced that desire? You said it better than I could, Tim. You win. I mean, it's not a joke <laughs> that I used the Riverside Shakespeare as a booster seat. That's literally what happened. I sat, when I had to reach the table, I sat on this giant edition of Shakespeare my mother had that was very water stained. And uh, it was a, you know, a book that I read very early and I started memorizing not Shakespeare poems, but the speeches from Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth and, and uh, Richard III. And I would memorize these speeches and say them to my, you know, hungover mother. And she liked it. You know, it was something she encouraged. I got her attention that way. She was a very, to say she was not nurturing. <laughs> I mean, Lady Macbeth is probably uh, not nurturing the way my mother was not nurturing. I mean, she, she was, her disinterest in being a mother was profound. Let's just put it that way. She once said to me when I was early, uh, early on, when I was getting sober, I, she was supposed to watch my little boy who was then a toddler when I went to an AA meeting. And I came back one day and she was like, she said, I, just, I can't keep him. He's just too, I mean, I was gone for an hour and a half. She said, I just don't do kids. And I was so mad. I said, mother, you had four children. What do you mean you don't do kids? You don't cook, you don't clean, you haven't had a job in 40 years. What exactly do you bring to the party? 
And she thought for a minute and she said, uh, I'm a lot of fun to be with. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I forgot to do anything for any other he- living human being, but I am fun to be with, which was not untrue. So I guess I had an aesthetic sense. Uh, she played music. She played opera. She played blues. Janis Joplin grew up in my hometown, or rather I grew up in her hometown since she was older. Her brother would be in my high school carpool. So there was a lot of music I listened to. And I think poetry was part of that, the form, the shape. I, You know what it felt like, Tim? I felt less lonely. I was a lonely person. And I would read these poems and I felt like someone understands me. Someone uh, knows what it feels like to occupy this body. And I remember trying to tell other little kids in my neighborhood about it, about poems that I like to remember. There's a E.E. E. Cummings poem I once tried to tell some girls about in my school. You know, it's just spring and the world is mud luscious and the little lame balloon man whistles far and wee and Eddie and Bill came, come running and it's spring and the world is a puddle wonderful and the goat footed balloon man whistles far and wee, something like that. I can't even remember it, but it's so long ago. <laughs> That's pretty good for not remembering. I can remember little <laughs> bits of it, but I remember these girls in my school just going, what are you talking about? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, what about it doesn't make any sense. You know, it's about it's being spring and it's, and she's like, well, what is the mud lush? It's like, that's not even a word. I mean, no, it's like muddy and luscious and delicious. And it's like, how is mud delicious? You know, it's like, I'm like, no, like y'all aren't getting it. And I thought they were messing with me. It seemed so obvious to me how great this was. So I learned to shut up about it very early, you know, by like third, fourth grade, I learned just don't, you like this stuff, nobody else, your mother likes it, your sister likes it, your daddy likes it, nobody else is going to like it, you just shut up. One expression that I think was in the Art of Memoir, I've read it in other interviews, and again, I'm probably going to paraphrase here, but that poetry should disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. Yes. I wish that that were my line. Isn't that a great line? It's so good. Where is that from? Or do you recall where you learned it? Yes. I know. I know vaguely where it's from, but I can't remember the guy's name. You can Google it. It's, um, we'll find it early 20th century, maybe 1920s to 1950 journalist guy. So I'm sorry. I didn't, I don't cite him. I wish I could take credit for it. But yeah, all art should disturb the comfortable and comfort that's disturbed. And all therapy should, and most foods. <laughs> you know, it's not a bad goal to shoot for at the beginning of a day. How did you weasel into college? If you How could, did I if weasel you could into college? Flash, flashback, because I would imagine that there's some listeners like me who are just in their mind's eye seeing this little girl sitting on Shakespeare and out of focus behind her head in the same kitchen are bullet holes in the tile. (laughs) (laughs) Imagining the experience and the experiences, although truly you endured some horrific, horrific things, but wondering how does someone in that position get into college, Uh, especially when they're missing, at least based on some of my homework, for instance, 87 days of school in the sixth grade, things like this. How on earth does someone get into college? Was it your wielding of words and an essay that just unlocked it? Was it something I, else? I, I won an essay contest when I was in high school. I remember, I think it was from the National Council of Teachers of English. And I had some professors, actually my my mother had gone back to graduate school and got me a recommendation from this teacher of Chinese history who felt me up, uh, sexually assaulted me in his office and then wrote me a recommendation. And so maybe that helped. Actually, what I think helped when I look back on it was I had, I opposed the Vietnam War and I wore black armbands on moratorium day. And, and that's the kind of thing that where I grew up, you know, I remember my coach, the football coach pinning me up physically like pinning me up against the lockers by the front of my shirt and holding me against the lockers and threatening me essentially to take my black armband off. So I did things like I didn't stand up for the American flag. I mean, I don't know. I thought I was Colin Kaepernick or something. It didn't win me any friends. Let me just say that. 
But I later found out when I got to my school and I had a had to have a lot of jobs to go there because it was a private school. It was, it was McAllister College. It wasn't. It was a, it's a very good school. And I later found out that the assistant principal of my high school, who had thrown me out a lot for things like my skirt was too short. One time he threw me out for not having a bra on. And I said, what makes you think I don't have a bra on? And then he called in the gym teacher to look under my shirt and confirm. In fact, I didn't have a bra. So I was just, I was a pain in his ass. And I later found out that he called McAllister and told these people in the admissions office that I was a bad citizen that I wouldn't stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance and stuff. Well, they hear this old redneck assistant principal, and they hear about this little girl who's doing this, and they think, she sounds great. She's perfect. (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) So I actually think my misbehavior that got me in so much trouble and made him hate me so much, I once had an algebra teacher reveal to me, he really is after you, like you're not paranoid, like he's he's really, he (laughs) wants you out of here. And so- I actually think, I don't know how I got in. I don't know how I got in. It was clearly a mistake. I made a D in art, you know, my senior year. And my mother was a painter. So, I mean, all I had to do was slap art on something and I would get, have gotten, you know, a B. And I couldn't, I couldn't handle the pressure. It was too hard. So I don't know how I got to college. But once I got to college, I've got to say, I really... Well, everybody else was complaining about their parents and the, you know, I don't know that you that you couldn't weren't supposed to smoke pot in your room or whatever they were mad about. I was like, this is great. <laughs> this is all these people read books and they'll talk to you about them. And I made straight A's and I got a scholarship and it was just shocking uh, to me that I might succeed at something. You know. Mm. What about the environment, aside from people who read books and are willing to listen, if it was the environment, maybe there are other variables led to the straight A's. Was it being outside of your home environment? Like, What was the recipe that contributed to that sort of conversion of sorts from D for defiant to straight A? Maybe you were still defiant, but you got straight A's. I wasn't defiant. I was. I wanted to please people. I mean, I think I had a lot of jobs. Like I had a job, I had one of those hairnet wearing jobs at the food service where I had to go in at like four in the morning and like cook scrambled eggs and wash dishes and stuff. And so I think in some ways I had to organize my time, but I had been living with a bunch of drug dealers before I went to college out in Southern California. We moved out there initially, we lived in cars and stuff. And then we got some, a couple of us were slinging dope mostly pot and psychedelics, although one guy had robbed a drugstore. And it was just, it was, I I was hitchhiking one day from Laguna Beach to San Clemente where my friends were surfing. And I got picked up by a guy who really scared me. I thought he was going to rape me and had to jump out on the side of the road. And it's interesting because there were six of us who lived in that house when I left home. And of the six, Four went to jail, and two of those were dead before they were 20. And only me and one other guy, my, who's still my best friend, Dooney, wound up getting sober. And we both kind of made it, quote unquote, him in construction in Southern California and me doing whatever it is that I'm supposed to be doing. So I was scared. I was scared by how dark things that I brought the darkness with me. You know, you get to Southern California from where I grew up and you're like, where has all this been? You know, everybody's orthodontured and, you know, (laughs) you know, people's teeth are great and nobody's missing any digits or anything. They, nobody's, you know, everybody looks so amazing and everything's so beautiful. And you're like, God, I've never seen anything like this. Golly. And so you would think everything would have been great. But, you know, as you know, when you have a lot of trauma growing up, you bring the darkness with you. So I had this idea after the, I was hitchhiking and I got scared. I had to jump out of this. I tried to, went to jump out of this guy's car. It was a Volkswagen and that had no back seat and had a bunch of garbage in it. And I pulled up on the handle of the door and it just went floppy round and round and round like it was locked and I couldn't get out. 
And so the window was open, stuck open, wouldn't go up, wouldn't go down. And I stuck my arm out the side of the window and opened it from the outside and, and jumped out and went down this like embankment on the side of the road. And I was, I was really scared. I was, you know, how those moments of trauma are. I was scared like I had been when I was a little kid and there were bullets flying around my house. And, and I thought, I know, you know, I'll go to college in Minnesota. And I mean, it's just, that was the other thing. Everybody in Minnesota is so damn nice. Have you ever been there? I have. I have it's just spent time there. <laughs> I couldn't, but I used to make a joke about about my call, an unkind joke. I'd say, if you're not a virgin, when you get here, you will be when you leave. It was just, <laughs> everybody was so damn nice. Oh my God. I'd never seen such nice people in my life. And it's still, I got there and I did extremely well for two years and I won all these prizes. And then I dropped out. I couldn't handle the prosperity. You know, I couldn't handle the success. So I was a long way. It took me a while to finally start getting sober, I guess. I guess that was a lot of my problem. Which we will definitely talk about. I want to dig into that. And I also am going to ask you just to plant a seed about how those mentors initially convinced you to go to therapy. But first, I want to bounce around chronologically. Yes. Because from these origins, I've, in the process of doing my homework, read about your graduate seminar at Syracuse described as hyper-selective. And uh, you're certainly a writer and poet of great note at this point, right? Lots of people know who you are. Lots of people love your work. Lots of people love you describing the craft and process that goes into your work. How do you select the students who make it into your graduate seminar, or how did you? I mean, I do it. It's I wish I wish they would just give me a wand and I got to pick all my people. But interestingly, uh, I've been teaching there, gosh, thirty years, something like that. I only teach in the fall, uh, and I go and I commute and from New York City. So we do it based on the work. We do it solely based on the writing. And you know, some years, George Saunders, my colleague got George Saunders had gotten so has gotten so famous that, you know, he attracts a lot of people and have a lot of people who teach there, Arthur Flowers, Juno Diaz is taught there. We just, we have gotten up to, you know, 1,200 applications at for uh, 12 positions. Just a quick thanks to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Wealthfront. Did you know if you missed 10 of the best performing days after the 2008 crisis, you would have missed out on 50%, 50% of your returns? Don't miss out on the best days in the market. Stay invested in a long-term automated investment portfolio. Wealthfront pioneered the automated investing movement, sometimes referred to as robo-advising, and they currently oversee $20 billion of assets for their clients. Wealthfront can help you diversify your portfolio, minimize fees, and lower your taxes. It takes about three minutes to sign up, and then Wealthfront will build you a globally diversified portfolio of ETFs based on your risk appetite and manage it for you at an incredibly low cost. Wealthfront software constantly monitors your portfolio day in and day out, so you don't have to. They look for opportunities to rebalance and tax loss harvest to lower the amount of taxes you pay on your investment gains. Their newest service is called Autopilot, and it can monitor any checking account for excess cash to move into savings or an investment account. They've really thought of a ton. They've checked a lot of boxes. Smart investing should not feel like a roller coaster ride. Let the professionals do the work for you. Go to Wealthfront.com slash Tim and open a Wealthfront investment account today, and you'll get your first $5,000 managed for free for life. That's Wealthfront.com slash Tim. Wealthfront will automate your investments for the long term, and you can get started today at Wealthfront.com slash Tim. You end up with these, these 12 gems of assorted colors and kinds. Yes. What is day one, class one? What does that look like? Oh, you're thinking my met when I teach my memoir class. Yeah. Well, I used that's to right. do I used to do this thing. Yeah, that's so funny. I used to do this thing where I would stage a fight in my class with someone who was opposite from me. And uh so let's say, you know, like my colleague George Saunders, who is just the sweetest guy. I can't even tell you. I I was in the car with him once and there was a bug on his shirt, and I was like, George, there's a big 
beetle on your shirt and you'd be like, well, he has to be somewhere. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'd be like, kill it. And he's like this, this uh, Tibetan Buddhist with this amazing practice, you know, just the sweetest guy. So George comes in and starts arguing with me that my classroom is in fact his classroom. And this is in front of all the students, in front of all the students. And it's for them, it's the first day of school. And it's like having their parents fight. And I script it so that I say only nice conciliatory things. I back up, he walks forward, he's bigger than I am. And then it ends with with him like throwing the papers up and, you know, telling me to go fuck myself or something. And or telling me to go hang. Maybe I don't know if you can say the F word. Can you say the F word? F word is not not only allowed, but endorsed okay, since good. I grew up on Long Island. You're in good company. I feel so much better. <laughs> Just telling me to go fuck myself. And and then we ask the students to write. So let's say there are 17, 18 students in this class, 20 somewhere between 15 and 22. And they're all smart and they're all young. They were all incredibly juiced on adrenaline and cortisol uh, because they were scared and it's a public scene and they don't really know each other that well and they don't know us that well. So they're all extremely alert. They're hypervigilant. And we ask them to write down what happens and everybody writes something just a little different. Interestingly, people will describe me in very aggressive terms. Like, even though I'm the one backing up and I'm saying, well, I can clear out during the break, George, but like, I don't understand why you're so upset. And he'll say, you don't understand why I'm so, I mean, and he walks forwards and I'm backing up and my head is down and I'm doing every conciliatory gesture I can think of. And people will say, you know, she stood her ground like a bulldog or she had military strength facing off against him. And one year I did it with my student assistant who was uh, an undergraduate, just a beautiful young track star, Betsy. And, you know, Betsy just threw her papers up in the air and was screeching at me. Well, you know, she's this kid and here I am, this professor with, you know, fancy clothes in a position of power. So people would, in that class of undergraduates, assume that I had done horrible things to Betsy that had, in one class, there was a young woman, one of the ruses I set up is that I leave my cell phone on so I can start to argue with George before he comes in and then ask the students, you know, how often did he call? How long between each call? And ask them to guess things or remember things about time. And some people, he calls three times. Some people say he called once. Some people four times. So all those details are very influenced by who they are. The young woman with sickle cell anemia will have this enormous compassion for me because I'll say, I have to leave my phone on. I'm waiting for medical results. And she'll assume I'm waiting to hear if I have some awful ailment. And she sees George as a complete beast and me as this woman, perhaps ill, who dragged herself to class while everybody else in the class thinks, what a diva. She's answering her phone in the middle of class. She can't wait an hour to get medical results. I mean, come on. So there are always people in in class who have eidetic, you know, have those perfect memories. I remember one kid, often they're musicians. This kid was a jazz saxophone player who was very famous in Brooklyn for giving these amazing house parties. I think he made a living giving house parties for like, I don't know, years. (laughs) So this kid had this amazing memory. He got, we had a script and he remembered the script exactly. He remembered what George had on. He remembered where we stood. He remembered that I backed up every step. And then when he wrote it, he wrote it exactly as it happened. He didn't miss anything. And he said, George was the aggressor, but I wonder what she'd done to make him act that way. I guess the purpose of the exercise is for you to realize that you remember through a filter of who you are. Memory is not a computer. It's not a perfect storage system. Obviously, we even these fine minds of these young people, very alert and paying attention in their first class and wanting to get everything right and do well, misremember. And what's more, what I want them to think about is how they are not just 
perceiving things, but beaming the world, the landscape into being with whoever they are inside. It's important as a writer of anything to realize what kind of filters you're strapping on that prevents you from seeing what's going on. I would imagine that is an opening exercise that a lot of your students remember, speaking of memory, for a very, very long time. What other exercises or aspects of your teaching, it could be in in any setting, do many of your students remember or have stick out for them, would you imagine? I think a lot of practice things, a lot of I think it's important as a writer or as in anything to develop, you know, habits. I mean, you talk about this and for our body, for our work week, you've developed a lot of practices in your life to shape your life so that you're kind of operating, you know, to constantly be growing and developing. And so things like keeping a commonplace book, just keeping a notebook where you write down beautiful pieces of language. What is a commonplace book? That is where you capture the sort of beautiful turns of phrase that you encounter? Yeah, things you read. So you might copy poems. um, You might copy over here is something you overheard on the street. There was a guy standing on my street. This is like a couple of years ago when I first moved into this apartment screaming murder or suicide at the top of his lungs. And everybody was walking around the street, walking around him. And it was early in the morning. And I walked up to him and I said, excuse me, sir. He was screaming murder or suicide, murder or suicide. And I went up to him and said, sir, isn't there like a third alternative? Like, isn't there a door number three? And... (laughs) that. (laughs) <laughs> that little encounter I wrote down, but but things I overheard. Well, well, hold on, hold on. That's too much of a cliffhanger. So what happened when you said that? Well, you know what was beautiful? <laughs> uh, I went into, I was going in to get a pastry for a friend of mine who was visiting from London. I got him one. I thought I'd bring him a pastry when I came out. But when I walked into the bakery, he was looking at the sky, you know, with a curious look. You know, he was thinking, like, isn't there a door? Isn't there a door number three? Isn't there another? Gosh, there might just be a door number three. But mostly what I write down are pieces of language or things, poems that I read, paragraphs, anything, so that you're just constantly copying in longhand. You can't type it. You're you're constantly copying things that are beautiful. You're constantly guzzling beauty. You're guzzling the beautiful language so that you're kind of steeped in it, you know, like a fruitcake (laughs) and good good brandy. (laughs) Is the value of the commonplace book and using it this way in the writing down, or do you have some approach to review or using that later? You know, I I occasionally, I mean, the great thing about them is that if you get on an airplane or you're going along, you sort of know what you're reading. But I've also been doing this, a poet named Stanley Kunitz, who was a poet laureate in like 1978 or something, told me to do this. So I've been doing this since 1978. Also, every time I give a lecture, I put the quotes I use in the lecture on, on index cards. And so I have like you know, I've been teaching for 40 years. I mean, I, I I have 40 years of index cards with quotes on them. It's oddly satisfying. I don't know what it is. It's, But it's just like, it's like a sit-up you do. It's like a push-up you do. It's uh, something you don't really, I often don't look back on. I think it's in the writing down. I think it's in the practice. And it's kind of, it's like an altar. You're making an altar for yourself every day. You know, I wanted to... Might as well use this as a segue. Alter, could you speak to the importance or utility of prayer in your life? Yeah, I mean, I'm a prayer. I was an atheist my whole life, and I got sober in 1989. And believe me, I drank my share. I did my part. I remember some guy I went to high school with telling me, I was when my mother was still alive. I was home, and he says, "You don't even, you don't even drink anymore. You don't even smoke pot." I was like, "No, Jack O'Lantern, I, I don't 
I don't do that stuff anymore. It's like, why? I was like, well, it just didn't agree with me. You know, it made me do things that I didn't want to do. And he says, well, I just think you're a quitter. <laughs> <laughs> I just think you're a quitter. I just think you gave up. I mean, what is smoking pot going to do? You never going to like rob anybody's television or anything. <laughs> He said, well, that's true. That's true enough, Jack Leonard. But you have had this job pumping gas since the 11th grade. <laughs> uh, I, and, please and you, tell me this guy's name was actually Jack Lantern. <laughs> his name was Jack. We called him Jack Lantern because of a sad tooth, <laughs> tooth thing he had going <laughs> on. Uh, and because we were not ones to stand on ceremony. And he said, uh, <laughs> I said, you have had this job <laughs> since the 11th grade, and you're 50 years old, and you have an ambition deficit disorder <laughs> by my yardstick. So, no, it, but he would say, Jack Larry, he'd say, don't call me that no more. I'm like, what do you want me to call you? Like, that's your name, dude. That's been your name since you were 15. That's your name. What does prayer look like for you? What is, well, what is praying? I think it started off, I think poems are my first prayers, the ones that I read. Like I said, I felt less lonely. So I started praying not out of any virtue, not I didn't believe in God. I had no I had no religious training whatsoever. When I was a little girl, you know, people would say would talk about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny. I thought they were kidding. I thought they don't really believe this horse shit. I mean, you know, I knew <laughs> I figured out pretty early on, you know, by the time I was like seven, six or seven, people were serious that they prayed when people weren't looking at them. I couldn't believe it. It was shocking to me. And daddy would say, well, you know, folks ignorant, you know, what you're going to do. So I had not a religious bone in my body, but I did notice when I tried to stop drinking <laughs> that I couldn't like, <laughs> like that. I tried to stop drinking for two or three years and I tried by myself and I tried drinking only beer and I tried drinking only alone. I tried drinking only with other people. And I tried drinking only wine. I tried drinking with food. I tried drinking, you know, weekends. Not, I mean, I just somehow I had crossed some line where I just couldn't, I couldn't stop drinking. And I went to get help and I went to sat in church basements and I hated everybody I saw who was sober. I just hated them. They just seemed like you know, the guy selling incense at the airport. I just didn't like them. Um, they just didn't look fun. And I just, they were so nice too. It was like getting to Minnesota. They're, hi, you know, welcome. I'd be like, oh God, I hate these people. And finally, the last time I drank, the last night I drank, I had gotten, I'd gotten together for like, it was the longest amount of time sober I'd had since I was 15. And I'd gotten together 90 days sober by going and, you know, sitting in church basements and talking to people who were sober. And I got a 90 day chip. And then I had to give this talk. I had to give a poetry reading at Harvard. Sorry to interrupt. Just since I, I don't know how much familiarity, when you say 90 day chip, is that some like literal token that you were given? A, because it looks like a poker chip. Mm -hmm. And so like you get one the first day you go and then you get one at 30 days and, and 60 days and 90 days. So this was for me an epic accomplishment. I mean, there was no time that I ever re ran the hundred yard dash in that was as important to me as that 90 day chip. And I was happy that I was sober. I felt better. I was sleeping better. My kid was better. Everything was better. And I had to give this poetry reading at Harvard college and I, didn't I was nervous. I'd never given a reading without drinking. The reading went okay. I, I was teaching at a bunch of places, including one class there, and I went out with some of my students. And the next thing I know, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm my car's spinning out on Star Drive in in Boston and and I'm going towards this concrete and I somehow didn't crash the car and I somehow got home and and so at that point, everybody had been saying, you know, you've got to get on your knees and pray. And there was this great uh, heroin addict, uh, recovering heroin addict, Janice, at this halfway house where I did volunteer work. I drove people to meetings, basically, and uh, would pick people up and drive them to meetings. A lot of disabled people. And Janice said, just get on your knees. And I'm like, Janice, you know, I don't believe, I, what kind of God wants me to grovel? And go, oh, God, you're so great. Ooh. And she said, you don't do it for God, you asshole. In that Boston <laughs> accent, you don't do it for God, you asshole. I'm like, well, who am I doing it for? She's like, you're doing it for yourself. 
just get on your knees. Just say, help me stay sober in the morning. Get on your knees. And I say, thank you for helping me stay sober. And so I'd be like, okay. So I get on my knees. I help me stay sober. And at night I'd say, thank you for helping me stay sober. Well, some weird thing started to happen. I mean, sometimes I would literally shoot the finger at the light fixture because I just thought, I hate this. You know what's terrifying about praying is the loneliness of it. I always tell people, young women I, I sponsor, you show more faith praying when you have never prayed before than any nun to sit in that silence with all your fears and all your self-doubt is so scary and hard. If you have a big loud head like I do and like I have a big inner life and and it my mind never has anything good to say. It thinks it can kill me and go on living without me. Something started to happen. I would have these moments of quiet. And the only way I can describe it is it was south of my neck. It was like in the middle of my chest. If if I was living my life with my head like ta- yammering at me like a chihuahua all day, do this, don't that stupid bitch, put that down, pick that up, go over there. I mean, it was just <laughs> you, you eat this, don't eat that, call him, I hate him. You know, like just these moments like in the middle of my chest would be like this broad expanse of quiet. And I remember one particular day, our little shitty car broke down. My kid was a toddler and he was, I had to pee. We were on the road. I didn't break down. I had a flat and didn't have a spare, a working spare. It was rush hour. We were on Memorial Drive. We were trying to get home. And I just, in that moment, what I normally would have done, you know, I would have been there, you know, like throwing the jack around and trying to get the car jacked up and in a state of indignant fury that I didn't believe in God, but I believed that there was fate that had doomed me to misery and that the guy with the Jaguar would always get my parking place right before I pulled in. And, and I believed I had a head that had memorized the bad news and, and spewed it out all day. And I remember that day, it was the sun was setting. I just got out on the side of the road, I got Dev out of his car seat and the sun was going down and he was looking at me afraid that I was going to be like angry. And I just sat there and he said, he was hungry and I didn't have anything to eat in the car. And I'm sitting there and I said, let's just look at the sunset a minute and then we'll, we'll go, we'll walk and we'll get some help. And we were just sitting there looking at the sunset and this truck pulls up with these Goomba guys from, from this 12 step meeting. And they have ginger ale, they have a jack, they have a way to tow my car, they give Deb potato chips. And it was just like, you know, all I have to do is just find some space in my body and just wait for a minute. And so I started to notice things happening when I wasn't bent over the day like a dog over like a bone that was about to be stolen. (laughs) Uh, You know, like that when I could just, I could just like sit there for a moment. And so I began to get a space in my body and I began to get, I began to hear not the voice of God. I would call it, I would have some leanings. Like I would be thinking I should have just killed myself. Like literally, this is what I'd be, I should have killed myself. My husband would marry some nice girl who wore barrettes and my son would have this great mother and and his life would be better if I weren't there. And I would hear this voice in my head that was like, you need a sandwich. (laughs) Why don't you get a sandwich? Like it would, it would, it would, why don't you make yourself like the biggest sandwich you can make? And I'd be like, oh, great idea. Like I just started to have these small, good ideas that were not like anything I'd ever heard when I was afraid before. Yeah. Then I had all these crazy spiritual experiences. And like one of the things I had this great sponsor, Joan the Bone. God, I loved her. She was so great. She was the kind of girl who lived in Alaska and would go to the bar when it was like 50 below in a tutu. I mean, you know, she was just like a badass. Like she was just, and she was a Harvard social theorist too, I've got to tell you. She was just 
all Joan that. Joan the Bone. Joan the Bone. All that and a bowl of biscuits. Yeah. Sounds like a, a mobster. What is the what's the what's the origin of the name? Do you have any idea? I just called her that. That was my nickname for her, Joan the Bone. Ah, I see. I see. All right. Joan the Bone. And Joan would tell me things like, I was such an ingrate. She'd say, you have to make a gratitude list. And so she'd call me and say, what's on your gratitude list? I would say, I have all my limbs. She'd say, no. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. <laughs> you're going to make a gratitude list every day this month for every letter of the alphabet. And you're going to call me and read it to me. I said, shut the fuck up. I'm not going to do that. She's like, yes, you are. Or else, you know, like, I won't talk to you anymore. I'd be like, okay. So I just started <laughs> trying. I just started trying. Instead of sitting there with my arms crossed and my lower lip stuck out and my baseball cap pulled down over my eyes, I just started trying shit that people who were happier than me suggested I should try. <laughs> it was so simple. And I started to get a sense. Um, and so one of the things I said to her, she said, you've got to pray for what you want. What are you praying for? I said, I pray to stand it. Yeah, not to kill myself, not mm, to, to get stand a, it. To stand it, just to get through the fucking day. That's what I'm praying for. And she said, okay, well, you've got to pray for what you want. What do you want? I said, I made $9,000 this year. I would like some money, please. She said, well, why don't you pray for money? I'm like, you can't pray for that. She's like, well, why not? I said, okay. So I would literally get on my knees in the morning and say, keep me sober. I would like some money. <laughs> I'm not even making this up. And I would get on my knees and say, thank you for keeping me sober. I would still like some money. Three weeks later, after I started, this is a true story, and you can look it up. I get a phone call from a guy who says he's from this foundation. He's giving me $35,000 that I'd never applied for or asked for, that somebody just put me up for. And I so thought it was, I thought it was my friend George playing a trick on me. And so I said, you know, fuck you, George. And I hang the phone up. And the guy calls back and he asked me on, you know, the speakerphone, you can hear people laughing maniacally. So I've never gotten money from prayer <laughs> again. But, but, and then Joan the Bone says, well, you must believe that there's some sort of God. I was like, no, because they, they were meeting to give me that prize before I had stopped drinking and started praying. And she said, Jesus Christ. And I would also talk to her all the time. I'd say, how can there be a God? Because look at the Holocaust. How do She's like, God didn't do the Holocaust. People did the Holocaust. <laughs> like, what are you mad at God for? People did that. God didn't do that. That has nothing to do with God. So that's how my prayer life started. It's a bizarre story. I like bizarre. So <laughs> Ignatian exercises, does yeah. that mean anything to you? Yes. Yes. I became a Catholic. I became a Catholic and I do something. I practice a kind of spirituality called Ignatian spirituality, which when you become a Jesuit, you go away to the Jesuit place or the Jesuit making place. So you, you do a quote, <laughs> you, you go to Jesuit school and then they put, give you this 30 day, these 30 day exercises. And the purpose of the exercises is to find God in all things. So like this election, which is just turned around to look at my screen to see if we had a new president yet. So this election, for instance. <laughs> just a side note, somebody just sent me a text before we started recording and said the entire country has electile dysfunction, which I thought was pretty clever. Oh <laughs> 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 Why didn't I think case. of that? Oh my God, <laughs> that that's was, so that was, great. Yeah, it was a clever turn of phrase, yes. Oh my so, God, no, it really right, so, is. So, we so have finding God in all things. <laughs> finding God in all things. So that means, you know, like when the car breaks down, instead of thinking, you know, your cruel fate, uh, you know, has come to hurt you. you. So what you do actually, Tim, is, is in the morning I do a prayer and meditation thing for 20 minutes where I do like, centering prayer for maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven minutes. And then I read a scripture and I meditate on the scripture. And, and then I have a bunch of people I pray for. I have a list of people I pray for and things I pray for. Then at night, I do something called the examine of conscience where you, it's not like going over your day and making a list of good things that happened or whatever, and then repenting for the bad things. It sounds like that, but it's not that. What it is, is you kind of press play on the recorder of your day. So you think, I woke up, and so what did I do? Where was I? What mindset was I in? And you close your eyes, and you try to 
review your day literally like you're watching a movie. And moments where you see moments of grace or or luck or even something, you know, a good sandwich, something yummy to eat, or you're supposed to savor those moments and occupy those moments. And it's a very it's a very body oriented exercise. You're supposed to smell. What do you smell? What do you hear? What do you taste? How do your clothes feel? You're supposed to really recreate that moment in a sensory way and thank God for the grace or the gift of that. And then you you kind of press play again and you see moments where you turned away from God or you you didn't, your best self didn't act and you uh, say, yeah, I, I want to do better next time, you know, instead of snapping at the robo call voice, snapping at Siri because she doesn't understand me. I love me for myself alone, you know, to just, uh, you know, I wish I were, I, you know, tomorrow I'd like to be more patient, help me to be more patient. So what it does is it made those moments of gratitude. And I also keep kind of a list or journal of those things and uh, a prayer journal, a daily, I don't keep a journal journal, but I keep a daily prayer journal. And, and I just will kind of highlight some of those things. Like for me today, right now, Steve Kornacki's haircut, which I know he does himself. I don't know. The guy who delivers the big map thing on MSNBC. I just like the guy. I just <laughs> like him. Every time I see him, I feel like I'm spending the night at my girlfriend's house and and he's her nerdy brother who's like secretly I just, hot. <laughs> I had this flash of panic because I was like, oh, fuck, here's somebody important. <laughs> I'm not saying he's unimportant, but I'm just saying, oh, God, no, here's another name that I have really, to pretend guy, I know because I'm on the guy, podcast. No, he's the guy who right. delivers the, the darn, you know, what the electoral map says on MSNBC. Got it, got it. So if you're a liberal, you're like a nut and you watch this the way other people watch other things. So he's this really nerdy kind of math goop guy who wears like khakis and a really like a clip on tie and has this really bad haircut. And I just have a complete crush on him. I just crush on him. I don't even like young men. I don't, I really don't. And you have to have some, you know, you have to have a, some hair coming out of yours for me to want to date you, but this guy just does it for me. <laughs> I just like him. I just like so, him. So wait a second. Tie that together for me. Is that does that have any, anything to do with the prayer journal? Yes. Or were you just confessing that? Oh okay. no, no. The- it's it's. I have a crush <laughs> on a ton of this guy who's on TV every day, and it tickles me to see him. It's kind of a little thrill. It's a little thrill to see him. It really is. It's so stupid. But it's also, it makes me feel like a child. It makes me feel like a, like I'm in junior high school. And so there's something innocent and sweet about it. Also, the fact that he's so dorky, I like. I just like that. So you have a prayer journal. You have I the do. commonplace journal. Right. Do you have any other journals? No, that's it. Those and are the two. The prayer journal, I don't really, I, I only write, like actually write, and I, it's mostly kind of looks like a list. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's mostly like a I list do. of things. Like the lady, uh, the lady at my drugstore, who the, my pharmacist, who uh, they were all out of, you know, the pneumonia vaccine. I get pneumonia a lot, and she went out of her way to call me and say, you know, I got you the pneumonia. You know, if you can come in right now, that we had a cancellation. I, you know, I can do the just kindnesses, moments of kindness, but also moments a presence and awareness of God. Uh, A lot of people feel it in nature. I feel a little bit in Central Park, which is all the nature I have. You're out. I am currently in Austin, Texas, which is home base for me. Shut the front door. Yeah, I've been here for three years. I live in the Republic of Austin. (laughs) Slash the Republic of Texas. One of my favorite t-shirts, not everyone's going to get this, but is a shirt with the Texas flag, which says most likely to secede on it, which which, which I quite like. Yes. So I'm in Texas, although a lot of Texans would would argue that I'm not in Texas. Of course. Yeah, I know. Right. Listen, do you have a weapon? If you have a weapon, you belong. I do. God, dog, it good for you. What do you have? 
Can I ask him we talk weapons? As far as weapons? Yeah, yeah. sure. I, I have a, a 7 millimeter uh, Win Mag hunting rifle. I have a, a Glock 34, which is a 9 millimeter. I know handgun. what it is. I know what a 9 millimeter oh, is. You know I don't know what a 9 course. millimeter I'm just, gun is. I'm not explaining it for you. I'm explaining it just like <laughs> getting on your knees, not for, <laughs> not for God, it's for you. I'm explaining to the listeners. So, 9 millimeter Glock 34. I have an MP 45. And a few other. Do you hunt? Firearms that I don't use much. I hunt, but infrequently. And that started in 2012. I always had a very negative association with hunting, uh, oh, just it's given a, my it's exposure kind of a great, to it. It's kind of a great yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. I had a very negative association because I saw very irresponsible of hunting did. on We've Long Island. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the process of working on the four hour chef and learning to forage, I felt it was incumbent upon me to hunt and if I were to consume animal protein. So I had my first deer hunt with an incredible hunter and conservationist named Steve Ranella. And that really completely shifted my lens on how ethical and responsible hunting could be. Now, in Texas, you have the whole spectrum from responsible I know, to I know. you know machine gunning hogs from helicopters, I know, I know. Uh, which exactly. I do not partake in. Although people could argue it's an invasive species, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, so I do hunt infrequently, probably you know let's just call it once every year or two. I'll, you know I'll those javelina hogs are fun to shoot. I'm sorry to say it. I'm embarrassed <laughs> to say it, but I've shot a javelina hog. So um, I'm anti gun, but pro hunting. <laughs> So does that make sense? <laughs> it does. I mean, I'm just imagining these kind of backwood kiwis in New Zealand hunting hogs with knives walking into the woods barefoot, which is a real thing. I know a case, one guy who did that. So you can be pro hunting while being anti, anti-gun. anti I think that's possible. No, but I mean, I w- if I were to hunt, I would hunt with a gun. But I'm. it's funny, one of my best friends is a young writer named Phil Lamarsh, who's, an ama- who's one of those guys who stocks his freezer with bow and arrow kill venison. And he called me this week and said a very interest. He just killed his a deer. And he said, you know, the longer I hunt, you know, the only thing I hate about it is the killing. I think there's there's a lot of shared sentiment to yeah. that, that uh, but the, by so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of hunters. Yeah. The, I mean, the most reverent people I know about the natural world are, are practicing. Many of them are practicing hunters. Mm-hmm. True fact. Well, I want to use this to tie a bunch of things together in the most awkward fashion possible. That's okay. Because I've been uh, been trying to force fit a segue somewhere, so I might as well do it here. Yeah, do it. And and that is to hear your description or explanation of how some of your wordsmithing came to be. Part of what I enjoy so much about your writing is that you have this, let me get this right, time critic Lev Grossman said in his review of Lit, Carr seems to have been born with the inability to write a dishonest or boring sentence. That's high praise. Now, love the, him. the the least <laughs> the least boring sentences for me. And God, I wish I could remember it. But you take this what seems like this sensitivity to language and poetry to create sentences using cat shit sandwich metaphors right. <laughs> and so on. Uh, which also seems to me, and maybe this is, you tell me if this is warranted or not, but to be a very kind of Texan thing also. It kind of makes me think of like a trial lawyer in God knows where in Texas, right? Who gets up and just demolishes some slick trial attorney from Los Angeles in a complete mismatch, right? I mean, just dismantles someone with these really clever turns of phrase where does that come from or how did that develop in you because i do think it is one of your one of your superpowers well i think growing up in texas is it's a storytelling culture you know i texas idiom is poetry as far as i'm concerned and i had two great practitioners i'm a seventh generation texan uh, on my mother's side and fifth generation of my daddy so my daddy was a great barroom storyteller i mean he was he was a labor union organizer for the oil, chemical, and atomic workers, local 12, 1242. And um, he was just funny as a crutch. And 
told these amazing kind of tall tales, <laughs> like out of out of Mark Twain. And, but he also spoke in poetry, like he would say, like a woman with an ample behind, he'd say, uh, she has a butt like two bulldogs fighting in a bag. And for him, that was a compliment. There was nothing <laughs> insulting about that. That he he used to call me. I'm a little skinny thing. He used to call me a gimlet ass. Pokey, you need you need some taller on that ass. You need you need you got you a gimlet ass. I don't even know what that is, but it, I knew it wasn't good. A little flat butt. Or he would say it's raining like a cow pissing on a flat rock. You can scan that, by the way. It's raining like a cow pissing on flat rock. It's, it's. Wait, it, what do you mean by scan real quick? Which, well, I mean, mean like, that? like it, it, Shakespeare is iambic pentameter mm -hmm. or my first love poem that was ever written to me. I saw you on your horse today, your eyes like eggs, your hair like hay. That's like, it's iambic pentameter. It's da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, uh, it doesn't matter what it is, but you can hear it when I say it, right? That it's yeah, raining totally. like a cow pissing on a flat rock. And that you hit that flat rock, it creates, for one thing, it creates a whole landscape in which cows piss on flat rocks and people stand around and marvel and go, my goodness, looky at that. And then you attribute that to the rain. It's, it's a metaphor. It operates way beyond the bounds of propriety. It's not how you talk in church. You're not supposed to talk like this. So the minute you say this and somebody laughs at it, you have them. They're in your boat. They have transgressed but by laughing at, at your joke. Well, Daddy was just the master of a story, but he was also a poetic imagery. I mean, to me, all, all that poetry I grew up, I was steeped in it. My mother, who was an enormous reader who read you know, everything, Chinese history and, and Russian novels and philosophy and, and just read everything, was just the master of, you know, I remember when she was dying, somebody, she had all these old men she, who were always trying to marry her, which, why? But she's dying. She's actively dying. And one of these old boyfriends has come to see her at the hospital in Houston, and the nurse bends over and says, Miss Carr, your husband's here to see you. And she says, well, he must look like shit. He's been dead 20 years. And, you know, I mean, she just, she just, she just can't stop herself from saying like the most horrible thing you've ever thought. <laughs> and so I think between the two of them and just growing up in, in Texas, the idiom, the language I grew up with is epically beautiful. And, the need to not be boring when you speak. You know, people will, I'm going to stomp a mud hole in your ass. That is so much better than I, I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I, yeah, right. Or <laughs> my friend Dooney got in a fight once with a guy in a bar, and the guy said, and he told the greatest story about it. It was actually the guy he decided to stab. He went out in his truck and got a knife and came back with like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts chasing this guy who was a state congressman, by the way. I won't tell you his name. But he starts chasing him around this bar. Well, to brandish a weapon in a place where alcohol is served is a mandatory, I think, 10-year sentence, seven, ten, some big, you know, it's not, it's frowned upon. And he's chasing this guy around. And what <laughs> somebody says to Danny at one point, that's a little bitty old knife you got there. He said, well, notice he don't want to get stabbed by it. <laughs> <laughs> And then, and then he runs out, and then it, we hear the siren. So here comes the say, here comes all woo, woo. Then he runs out. He gets in his truck, and one of those mall cops, security guys, runs out. And then he says, he stands in front of my truck, in front of my headlights, and he's got a belt buckle that will pick up HBO. <laughs> and he he holds his hands up and goes, halt, halt. And Dooney just puts it in first gear and hits the guy. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't hit him hard, but he knocks him down and then leaves and gets pulled over and is convinced he's going to prison for brandishing this weapon, for trying to hit this guy. But anyway, it turns out he had to call the guy to apologize. The guy's daddy knew Dooney's daddy. And he said, all he wants you to do is apologize. And Dooney's like, apologize? You know, I'll blow the guy. 
Like, are you <laughs> kidding? I don't want to go to jail. Of course I'll apologize. So, but he, but here's the punchline of the story. And this is what makes Dooney my, still my best friend since I was 15. So he calls the guy up and the guy answers the phone. He goes, uh, and Dooney goes, I am so sorry, man, about last night. I am so sorry. And the guy says, you almost killed me. And uh, Dooney says, man, I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was you. <laughs> Don't you want to say that, though, the next time somebody happens? I didn't know it was you. The next time you do some horrible thing. Next time I get in a really stupid argument with my girlfriend, that's what I'm going to use. Don't you want to say, I didn't know it was you, honey? I don't know. Only in the state of Texas do you have that story. It's just got all the elements of a Texas story. How could I not love it down there? I mean, oh, my God. Let's talk about revision. Okay, revision. Revision. I'm a, big I'm a big reviser. I'm a big reviser. You are a big reviser. But so you have said, you know, anyone who's read a rough draft of anything I write is just shocked at how bad it is. It's terrible. And what does the process look like? I mean, I know this is a very hopefully doesn't sound like a, a really naive question because I know that there's a there are many many aspects to revision. So I'll I'll lead with just a bit. This is from writermag.com. But Car says she takes a hard look at every sentence she writes. Can I make this sentence less boring, more interesting, prettier, more colorful, more true? So that's a teaser. What does your revision process look like? Because I've read that you threw out something like 1,200 pages. Threw out 1,200 uh, pages on, of lit. Yeah. Finished pages <sighs> too. That's not draft. And that was written oh, over about, oh. I want to say five or six years. And I remember when I threw it out. Tim, I was so upset. I had been, well, first off, they were about, they were about to hang me. I was so late. I was like seven years late on a contract. I mean, they, <laughs> and so I finally, my agent called me and said, you know, you're going to, you're going to have to, I said, you know what? I will sell my apartment and give the damn money back if they don't shut up and leave me alone. Like I, it's just going to take me a minute. So anyway, so I'd sent them I don't know. I'd sent them like 130, 140 pages. And my editor at the time estimated that I'd thrown out 1,200 pages. And let me tell you when she said that they sucked as bad as I thought they sucked. I mean, I knew they sucked when they sent them, which why I didn't want to send them. I wanted to keep working on them. So I just, I went to bed for like two days and I watched, you know, Dr. Phil reruns and a lot of cooking shows and I ordered a lot of curry. I think I had a whole pizza at one point and slopped around in my bathrobe. And then I called Don DeLillo. I was one of the people I call. Uh, it's like, you know, the nuclear button, you know, who's like just one of the great novelists and who's also happens to be a friend of mine. And I said, Don, I, I think I'm writing. A, he's like, what are you crying about? I said, I think I'm writing a bad book. And he said, well, who doesn't? And I thought about that and I thought, God, he's right. Tolstoy's written bad books. I mean, people I read, you know, every writer I know has written a bad book. So, okay. So, okay. So maybe it's just supposed going to be a bad book, but it's the book that's standing in line to be written. And I think I got, I became willing to fail, to just say what happened. So basically what it looks like is just clawing through a line at a time or a sentence at a time. I think one example I give in the art of memoir is that when I'm, my mother is driving me to college and I think the sentence I started with was something like mother drove me to college in her yellow station wagon we stopped every night at the Holiday Inn and got drunk on screwdrivers. I can't remember. Might have said puke and drunk on sc screwdrivers. I somehow was able to remember being in that car. The thing about my mother's yellow station wagon was that it didn't have an air conditioner. So that at that time, you could buy an air conditioner that strapped under the dashboard. Well, it would build up condensation. And when she turned right, and I was sitting in the you know shotgun, the water in the air conditioner would spill out onto my bare feet. And it was icy, icy cold water. And I remembered that we had stopped and gotten a bushel of peaches in Arkansas. 
and she was drinking vodka, driving, drinking vodka and, and orange juice and eating these, watching her eat a peach. You know, when you're 17 years old, to watch your mother eat and show any desire for anything is just so horrifying. You just <laughs> want to die. There's just nothing <laughs> uglier than watching your mother eat a peach when you're 17. <laughs> you just think, my God, woman, shut your mouth. Take a smaller bite. Jesus, it's not going anywhere. You know, but I, the smell <laughs> of the peaches and being in the, and suddenly I remembered that I had a copy of a hundred years of solitude that I had got, that was her book, but I had started reading and she said, read it aloud to me. And I remembered reading that book and driving. And I remembered the, you know, you grow up around these kind of Texas dirt farms. I mean, there's plenty of corporate farming in the state of Texas, but then you get to the Midwest and it's just so organized. It's just, there aren't the rusted cars in the yard and the refrigerator on the porch. You know, it's these rows and rows of corn and these big cinnamon colored silos. And I remember driving into that landscape up to that college and reading that book and thinking I could be a writer. I could, I, I, I somehow was able to remember those details and occupy that body in space and time and remember how disgusted I was by my mother and how terrified I was that I wouldn't do well at school, that I would fail. I'd been such a screw up. You know, I'd been arrested the year before with a bunch of kids and there was a bunch of dope and some of them went to jail and I didn't because the judge was a guy who had known my mother when she was a, a reporter for the local newspaper. And I still remember sitting in his, she came to pick me up wearing a leopard, she had leopard skin pajamas. It was July 4th. And she had on a beaver coat with a mink collar and those leopard skin pajamas in the, on this hot, night in Coons County, Texas. And here sits this judge behind this, this liver spotted judge with these palsied hands and every meal he's ever eaten on his tie when she came to pick me up. And he said, I remember your mother. She was the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen. And she said, oh, you old fool. I mean, it was just like, oh my God, mother, get me out of here. Sucking up is underrated. So anyway, yeah, I think it's, it's memory. It's, I do an exercise with my, um, I just did it the other day for a colleague of mine, Dana Spieto, a wonderful young novelist I teach with. And she's teaching an undergraduate class. And I said, you know, I want to do this right. There are 90 kids in the class. She said, I said, I want to do this writing exercise. She said, well, they're writing, you know, it's been uneven. And I said, trust me, everyone will write well. And you have them focus on a room they grew up in and to try to occupy the smell, to try to remember a room you were in where your mother's cooking, your grandmother, wherever you had a good meal when you were little and try to close your eyes and smell that because, you know, smell is the most primordial memory and the most emotional memory. And it's stored way back in that snake brain hypothalamus we have that is where all the trouble starts you try to get in that memory and interrogate your body about what you can smell, taste, touch, and then finally what you want. What are you yearning for and what's keeping you from getting it? Maybe it's a bite of the brisket or some of the barbecue or daddy's oysters coming up out of the fryer or what's going to keep you from getting it. It's my big footed sister who, as daddy said, nothing ever got between her and a bag of groceries you know, she's going to get all the oysters and I won't get any. And so it's really more about trying to occupy a former self. Because I think, as you know, just as in trauma, the body remembers, the body also remembers beauty. It also remembers pleasure and love and uh, those other things too. So So the body keeps the score. And if you go excavating for these memories, sometimes there are costs associated with that. Hard, I've, total I've hard read, show. Yeah, I've, so I've, you know, I've read that while you were working on The Liars Club, that you'd suddenly fall asleep in the middle of the afternoon as if you'd driven all night and you, know, you would sob, you'd really suffer. What did you do to cope with that pain? And I should just say, 
you and I were chatting before the recording about trauma a bit. And, you know, I've recently described some of my childhood sexual abuse and the podcast that I did related to it didn't seem to exact a horrifying toll, but the process years before of trying to write about it and getting a very, very rough draft brutalized me and just left me paralytic for God, more than six months in some ways. And I'm I just so love to. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And I, I'm horrified by the experience, and also fascinated by it in a way because I, I don't know why those two things should be so different. And I'd just love to hear you expand a bit on the price that you've paid or or your experience with dredging up a lot of these memories or recalling them, putting them down, and why writing seems, at least in my experience, to be so different from some other forms of expressing these things? Well, I mean, because you're alone. Uh, you're alone. I mean, that's, I mean, that's for me where the prayer and the God and the God comes in. I do have a sense now that I didn't have back in the day. I mean, when I, by the time I started writing Liars Club, how old was I? I don't know, 35. I've been in therapy for 16 years. And I had also had a prayer practice for, um, you know, a meditation and prayer practice for some years. I, I hadn't converted. I wasn't a Christian. I didn't, I was a Catholic, but I was about to become Catholic. And I was very active in recovery programs and I had a sponsor. And I also had, based on all of those efforts, I had done a lot of the processing and recovery. I had flown down to Texas when I was 23 years old and got my mother drunk on margaritas and told her, you know, you tried to kill me with a butcher knife and it's not because I was a bad kid and it ruined my life. And what the hell was wrong with you? What was going on? With you? you know, I had done a lot of that work before I, and I tell people, when they tell me they want to write a memoir about some horrible stretch of childhood or some awful period of trauma, maybe they don't. Maybe they don't right now. So I think I had a sense of, you know, when I was drinking, my idea of medicating myself or anesthetizing myself, that was all I knew how to do. That was what my parents told me to do. That was all they knew how to do was dr- try to drink it away. Uh, you know, my daddy was in the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, he went went in at Normandy and he came out at Buchenwald. I mean, that's plenty of trauma. Plus, being married to my mother would have been simple. Uh, there's only one person with a weapon, <laughs> as opposed to the Nazis. So, yeah, I think I'm a big fan of uh, a hot bath. I'm a big fan of nutritious food. I'm a big fan of cardio. Even now, I mean, I'm 65. I don't do five dance classes a week, but I get up in the morning and I, you know, walk four miles. And then I do Pilates three or four times a week. And I take a dance class a couple of times a week. And all those things keep me in my body. And when I'm in a lot of pain, I take care of myself. When I've, when I was drinking, I felt like I had this screaming baby that I was holding and I was screaming at it all the time to shut up. So yeah, I think I still have even writing anything now I find very I'm not dealing with anything like that. I'm so much but I'm also I'm so much happier now than I've ever been in my life. I mean, I'm 65 years old. I've never been so happy in my life. I've never been less good looking, had less social power, had, you know, any of the things that you would think would make me happy, joyous, and free. And I'm just, I wake up every day really feeling lucky to be alive and feeling loved and feeling like, not every day. I mean, I wake up plenty of days and I'm, you know, mad as an old stomp pissant, but Most of my days are pretty lit up and it's a lifetime of practice. So I just, you know, I tell a lot of my students, my young students, you know, want to write about sexual assault or, or trauma 
of various kinds, well, maybe, you know, why don't you get some treatment for this first? Why don't you treat your heart first, treat your body, treat yourself uh, with a lot of care and see if this is what you want to write about right now, something you can write about maybe five years from now or something, you know. What advice would you give yourself about therapy if you were talking to your 19 or 20 year old self and how were you first convinced to go to therapy? I remember you mentioning that long ago. I, you know, I didn't have to be convinced. I mean, here's the other thing. Yeah, no. And there weren't a lot of people saying, gee, I wish you'd stop drinking. I mean, I led a pretty isolated existence the way a lot of people who grew up the way I grew up do. I mean, my idea of telling somebody how I felt, I remember right before I stopped drinking, I remember I was teaching, well, I sort of all over the academic ghetto around Boston, but I remember specifically one day at Tufts, I was copying something for a class and I was, I was, I had dropped my kid off, like vomiting out the side of the car before I dropped him off at daycare. I mean, and then I drove to Tufts and I was Xeroxing something and somebody said, how are you doing, Mary? And I was like, you know, I want to blow my fucking brains out. And that was my idea of telling somebody how I felt, you know, um, making a glib, sort of awkward, socially awkward statement to somebody I hardly knew. And I've been in therapy then for a while, but I was also drinking every day, everything I could get my mitts on. So I don't, I what don't is even, good? What is good therapy to you? Because therapy is is a term that's extremely broad. It's kind of like saying medicine, right? Yeah, so exactly. There are so many different specialties. What has proven to be good therapy for you? You know, you can, I think it totally depends on the on the person. I mean, the best yeah, for you. Ther- the best therapist I ever had. I think. I mean, for me, the difference in therapy and recovery. I think in therapy, I'm I'm the baby and they're the mommy. And that model sort of, uh, when I, especially when I first started, I just felt like I needed a lot of nurturing and I had great therapists. You know, my first therapist, when I look back on things he said and did was insane. He would have been fired. He told me to go down after he'd been seeing me nine months and confront my homicidal, suicidal mother about all this horrible stuff she'd done to me. And I did it. And he said, I won't see you until you do it. Wow. I mean, <laughs> if nobody's ever done it. For a penny and for a pound, yeah. I know. I mean, I look back on it, I was like, he was crazy. I mean, nobody's ever. I had a great therapist when my son was a baby who was a psychologist, PhD psychologist, and who really helped me try to learn how to be a mother when I hadn't had one. And all the, you know, feelings that come up around what you didn't get when you were a child, when you have a child, the protection and stuff. It's funny. My son watches me with his daughter now and just says, I don't know, you know, sort of gives me nothing but a stroke. And I said, let me just tell you, I was not this good with you. (laughs) You like, (laughs) Like I was crazy about you and I loved you, but I didn't have what I have now that I have with her that's just... It's not even, I don't even break a sweat going in there. I can do this stuff. I, I, it's funny. I was in Prospect, I babysit one or two days a week. I was in Prospect Park this week and I had taken her across the park in a stroller and a thunderstorm broke out. I mean, pouring rain. And she is the, like, I, I've never shared DNA with somebody this good natured as this baby. This baby coos, smiles, laughs, never cries. I mean, sleeps, eats is just the best natured kid. I, I I used to babysit in high school and college. So I've taken care of a lot of babies and she's just the easiest kid. I get across the thing, it's pouring rain and I've got, and she starts screaming, crying, like she's being beaten. And I take her out of the stroller and I hold her and she calms down. I go to put her back in the stroller. And she just starts screaming, crying again. Well, it's two miles across a muddy field in the pouring rain and I've got a stroller and a bunch of crap and I've got this, you know, 27 pound unit screaming unit. And, uh, I just had no problem doing it. And when I was 40 years old, 35 years old, it would have been like being beaten with a hose. 
And I just, I just thought, you know what? Daddy was in the Battle of the Bulge. This is not that hard. You know, I just had the physical energy, even at my age, that I didn't know I had to do it. And I got back to the house and I went to fold up the stroller. There was four inches of freezing water in the bottom of the stroller that I'd been putting her in. And she was soaked through to her skin. Yeah, there was, I, she was perfectly reasonable to be, you know, now I understand. I could have just emptied it out and put her in the stroller and care, wrapped her up in a blanket. But I, I didn't know what it was. But I just thought, well, I'll get her home and it'll be fine. You know, I didn't feel like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I'm a terrible mother and I'm going to wind up trying to stab her with a butcher knife, which is how I felt when my kid was that age. You know, I didn't know that I wasn't going to be my mother. I wasn't, I didn't know that. So scary. That is scary. Yeah, super scary. And, you know, it sounds like, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that you've learned in some form or fashion, or maybe many forms and fashions, to wear the world like a loose garment. I'd love to know if you agree or disagree, because based <laughs> would, on my I, reading- I at your, <laughs> Well, okay, so at your first confession- Absolutely not, no. Uh-uh. Priest said to you, wear the world like a loose garment. What does that mean to you? Well, I mean, I think it's not, you know, the problem isn't whatever your mind is telling you the problem is. The problem is the fear. And for me, the solution to fear is curiosity and presence. And I can't be terrified and curious at the same time. And so when I was walking the baby across the field, just all I was was physically uncomfortable. I mean, I was, you know, I was thinking, gee, can I shove this thing and hold her moose, you know, and get everything and get all this stuff. How am I going to do, you know? And so I went crossways across the mud fields. So I'm shoving the stroller and carrying her. I didn't know physically if I could do it. I was sort of dubious. I was thought, maybe I can't do this. But all I had to do was do it. I thought, well, if I get tired, I'll sit down. It'll rain on me a minute. Then I'll get up and go again. <laughs> like that's what we'll do. But I don't know. I I wouldn't say uh, it's not my nature to be. Here's the way I put it. I tell people it's like I have a trick knee. It's like most of the time I walk fine. I run fine. I can, you know, squat uh, more than my body weight and do advanced Pilates for an hour and 10 minutes. And I'm tough as a boot. But there are days that when there are days that I don't feel that way or there are moments where I get my knee goes out and I fall on the ground. And I, all I have to do is honor those moments. All I have to do is I have a, I have a heating pad. I have a weighted blanket. You know, I, I, my kids have a pit bull I'll bring to stay with me while an idiot is uh, my little comfort animal. You know, I call people. I still have a sponsor. I still have a therapist. I, I don't talk to all the time, but I didn't have to be convinced to go into therapy. I knew I needed it. But when I first started it, as you know, it was just so damn painful. And I just, for those of your listeners out there, if you're having a hard time, I just want to say it's like you lance a boil and the infection's draining off. And if you can just get by that, it's going to tell you that it's endless, but it's not endless. There's a bottom to it. So did you ever smoke? You never did. I was never a smoker. No. Mm-mm. Yeah, you're just such a jock. You're such a specimen. <laughs> you're such a specimen, well, no. Tim. Well, uh, well, we're all specimens. It depends on how we look on the autopsy table. <laughs> but the exactly. the uh, I was born premature, so I have respiratory issues in my left lung, and that does also that that was part of it. So I had a lot of breathing issues growing up to begin with, and secondly, I was sports saved me. So sports kept me out of a lot of trouble. Yeah. I, you know, I was good at sports and then I quit when I was like, I quit. And, uh, I'm much more of a jock now than I was then. You know, I wanted to ask ask about smoking. I was going to ask you about smoking because when you quit smoking, there's a phenomenon that happens. That's it's also when you quit drinking, but somehow it's more intense when you smoke, you'll have a craving for a cigarette. And the craving is as intense as it was the first day you quit. It's as overpowering. But if you just keep note of how long the craving lasts and how many of them there are, they're 
as intense, but they're not as long and as frequent. So it's the same thing about suffering when you first start therapy or you first lance that boil and you're unearthing some of the painful things you grew up with. It's as intense the first day and you just feel like, oh my God, I'm in the burn ward and I just got snatched out of the fire and I, every ounce of me hurts and I want to run screaming down the street like my hair's on fire. And it just won't last as long as it did the first time. And so if, for your listeners, if they, you know, if you're just, you know, looking at hard things that you grew up with, or you're trying to quit smoking, trying to quit drinking, trying to recover from trauma, I promise you, I will send you money if this is not true, that it will get easier. It's just, it's not linear. And there will be those days when it's as painful as the first day and you'll think, but I'm no better than I was, but you are. You just, it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Excellent advice. And uh, just, just, just a few more questions. I'm having so much fun. I can go forever, but I. <laughs> You've got a lot to do, I, dude. Ah, uh, do I, do I though? I don't know. I mean, Where it's, in it's, Austin it's, do you live? Well, I, I spend most of my time downtown for recording and then uh, live in the burbs outside mm -hmm. of that. I love it. I love it in Austin. And it's beautiful. Expect to be here for quite some time. I wanted to move here right after college. I didn't get the job, and uh, there was With only those morons. One. They screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, possibly. I also think that that could have been in everyone's best interest. <laughs> really? I, I think I make it a quite terrible employee in most circumstances. Me but, too. But, but at the time, at the time, and uh, you know, I didn't expect this to lead here, but. At the time that I was not given the the green light to get an offer from Trilogy Software way back in the day, it seemed like a death blow. Right, this seemed like the end of the world because I had put a lot of eggs in that basket. I didn't want to do anything that was recruiting on campus, really. Otherwise, and I listened to and watched your Syracuse University commencement speech. And oh, that's so nice of you. There's, there's, uh, and then I read, I read a transcript, and I think this is from the speech, unless it was sort of mistranscribed. But here's the paragraph: Almost every time I was super afraid, it was of the wrong thing, and stuff that first looked like the worst, most humiliating thing that could ever happen almost always led me to something extraordinary and very fine. So my question is: Could you give us an example of that that comes to mind? Uh, it could oh. be something humiliating. It could be a favorite failure, but anything that oh, I'll tell, I'll tell as you, it one turns of, out. One yeah. of the pr when I first did a when I first did a kind of moral inventory and recovery that they encourage you to do, I had a lot of resentments against God. Like when you say they, this is in a twelve step program. Yeah, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. Joan the Bone, you know, Joan the Bone, I, right? Like one of the things I really resented God for my son, who was just this little beautiful blonde haired blue eyed and a tank of a boy, a natural kind of athlete. When he was little, he was sick all the time. I mean, he would get a cold and he would get these sinus infections. His fever would go to like 105. We'd rush him to Children's Hospital in Boston. It was terrifying. We we're always rushing to emergency rooms because his fever was so bleeding high. And just so terrifying. And so I never slept. I never slept. And I was depressed. I was probably postpartumly depressed. And, and I was drinking. I, by then I had started, I decided drinking would help me take care of a sick child. Great idea, Mir. It's like the bad mom in the after school special. And, um, <laughs> and so what? And I remember... So when it came time to do Ignatian spiritual exercises, you were trying to find God in all things. Where is God in that? Where is God in a sick baby? I'll tell you a secret. When I actually looked at my life and the decisions I was making, I would have kept drinking. If I'd had one of those Playboy babies, uh, you know, that like sleeps 12 <laughs> hours a night, 
and you know, never is sick and just, you know, coos and cuddles and like, and, and I had been able to, I would have kept drinking if I had had my granddaughter who's like the easiest, like 12 hour night sleeper eats everything you give her, laughs at everything you do. I would have kept drinking. I could not physically drink the way a real alcoholic <laughs> needs to drink and take care of a kid who was sick all the time. Couldn't do it and work and make a living. I couldn't do all those things. It's too hard. And so I don't think God sent pathogens into my infant son's body. I don't know how any of this works. But when I ask where God is in this, that physical, my own physical discomfort forced me to get sober. So my sister died this summer very suddenly of pancreatic cancer in less than a I'm week. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry too. You know, we were not in touch. We had a terrible childhood and we had not been really in touch for uh, seven years. And that was my choice. And I remember saying to my therapist, isn't it going to be terrible when she dies? She said, yeah, it's going to be terrible anyway. And although it's horrible that she's dead, there's nothing. I feel my love for her. I don't have to defend myself against my love for her the way I did when we were estranged. I can cherish and remember all the times we were there for each other, all the ages we were in each other's lives. And yeah, it's, uh, I would give anything for her to be alive, but I still think our not being in touch was the best thing for both of us. You know, I don't regret that. And there's this amazing gift to me of being in touch now with her son and her husband and her stepchildren. And I would give anything if she were alive. But there are gifts in this suffering that are real spiritual gifts. I practice when things happen that I find very disappointing. My son had a film coming out, his first feature film coming out at Tribeca Film Festival. And it's a global pandemic, and so there is no Tribeca Film Festival, and he's raised somehow all this money and put years worth of work in and got to, you know and moved heaven and earth. And you know what? The film's being released. He's got a great distribution deal. He just won Best Director at Fright Fest, and you know it's unfolding just the way it needs to unfold. It's getting curious about about where the light is. You know, just being curious about where the light is. And getting curious about where the light is and the all powerful reframe. And it is really incredible what can happen, as you said, when you really get curious. I have to say in this the face on, of fear. on air, Tim, because I have to say it. I just I have so many young people who come to me about sexual assault, so many young men who have come to me, my students, young writers, young poets. And your being open about this on this podcast has just been such a gift to all these young men. Thank you. So good Thank for you, you. So good for you. So a horrible thing that happened to you that's being used to help a lot of, give a lot of people hope, and it's going to prompt a lot of healing. I, I hope so. And I, I've seen, seen a lot come out of the woodwork and uh, it's been simultaneously, and I know you've experienced this certainly, it's been simultaneously appalling, rewarding, and brutal in a way. I mean, it's, it's all of those things. I mean, there's a lot of pain and beauty in it. And you know, I'll just mention that of my closest male friends, and th there really aren't that many, I don't collect friends like... Uh, you know, little porcelain teacups or whatever people collect. Right. I have a fairly small-ish circle, and I would say 30% of yeah. my closest male friends reached out to me after that podcast to describe their own experiences with sexual abuse that I, I know. knew nothing about. And these are I people know. I've known for a very long time. So I hope there's healing. Of course um, there is. So. We're living, yeah. look, we're living, look, we're not curled up on the back wards of mental institutions, and we both could be. Yeah, very true.
Very true. Well, well Mary, we're going to talk again, and I want okay, honey, to ask bun. one more. One more question, which sometimes is a dead end, and I'll I'll own that if it is. Okay, then. But we'll see, we'll see where it goes. The question is: If you could put anything on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, to reach billions of people, however many you want, a word, a phrase, a question, a quote, a poem, anything, what might you put on oh that my billboard? God, that's so hardcore. Jesus. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That is really God. That's a little. You, you, you it's aggressive. It's aggressive. It's hardcore. It's aggressive. It really is. It's a little javelina <laughs> well, hogs. It's a pack of javelina hogs running out of the bushes at me. Um, <laughs> what could I? Uh, what would I put? And it doesn't have to be the one and only. This could just be the first one billboard. The first billboard. Yeah. You know, put down that gun. You need a sandwich. Um, <laughs> You need a sandwich and a hot bath. No, I know what I would put. I would put 90% of what, what's wrong with you could be cured with a hot bath. That's what I'd put. <laughs> I love it. I love that. Well, Mary, this has been so much fun. Been a hoot. Uh, I've, I've really, really enjoyed this. People can find you at your website, uh, marycar.com. That's Mary, K A R R.com. Twitter at Mary Carr Lit, L I T. Is there anything else you'd like to say, suggest, ask, request? No, of just the like let's, let's all heal. Let's all heal as a country, no matter how different we think we are. We're all suffering souls and we all want to heal this ribbon country of ours. So that's what I'm wishing for all of us and wishing everybody a lot of love and light today. And a big, nice cigar. <laughs> here, here. You're here. Yes, get, cur- get here curious. Get look curious. For the, look for the light. Uh, thank you, Mary. All right, for everybody. Well, you take care. You go do you. I will. And to everybody listening, we'll link to everything that we've mentioned in the show notes at tim.blog forward slash podcast. And until next time, thanks for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This podcast episode is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Sleep is super important to me. In the last few years, I've come to conclude it is the end-all, be-all, that all good things, good mood, good performance, good everything seem to stem from good sleep. So I've tried a lot to optimize it. I've tried pills and potions, all sorts of different mattresses, you name it. And for the last few years, I've been sleeping on a Helix Midnight Luxe mattress. I also have one in the guest bedroom, and feedback from friends has always been fantastic. It's something that they comment on. Helix Sleep has a quiz, takes about two minutes to complete, that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. With Helix, there's a specific mattress for each and every body. That is your body, also your taste. So let's say you sleep on your side in like a super soft bed, no problem. Or if you're a back sleeper who likes a mattress that's as firm as a rock, They've got a mattress for you too. Helix was selected as the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ Magazine, Wired, Apartment Therapy, and many others. Just go to helixsleep.com slash Tim, take their two minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10 year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk free. They'll even pick it up from you if you don't love it. And now, my dear listeners, Helix is offering up to $200 off of all mattress orders and two free free pillows at helixsleep.com slash Tim. These are not cheap pillows either, so getting two for free is an upgraded deal. So that's up to $200 off and two free pillows 
at helixsleep.com slash Tim. That's helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash Tim for up to $200 off. So check it out one more time. Helix, H-E-L-I-X, sleep.com slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by ShipStation. The holiday season is fast approaching, and we know that people will be buying more stuff online than ever before. All of these trends to e-commerce have been accelerated due to COVID and much more. If you're an e-commerce seller, are you ready to meet the demands of a record-breaking online shopping season? Be ready with ShipStation. ShipStation ShipStation.com is the fastest, easiest, and most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. In just a few clicks, you're managing orders, printing out discounted shipping labels, and getting your products out fast. Happier holidays for you and your customers. ShipStation takes the hassle out of holiday shipping. No matter where you're selling, on Amazon, Etsy, your website via Shopify or other platforms, ShipStation brings all of your orders into one simple interface. And ShipStation works with all of the major carriers, USPS, FedEx, UPS, even international. You can compare and choose the best shipping solution every time, and you can access the same postage discounts that are usually reserved for large Fortune 500 companies. It's no wonder that ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. And right now, my listeners, that's you guys, can try ShipStation free for 60 days when you use offer code TIM. Just go to the homepage, ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in TIM, T-I-M. That's it. Go to ShipStation.com, then enter offer code TIM, ShipStation.com. Make ship happen.